Um, welcome everyone. My name is Deanna Rader and I'm Acting Dean of Libraries and I'm just here to welcome you all and also to acknowledge the territories. We here, um, I'm speaking um, for myself, I've been able to raise my children and live for almost 30 years on the beautiful, traditional, unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Coquitlam, and Stalu peoples. And, and for that point, I really um, appreciate the, the generosity and the privilege it is to be here. I'm now going to pass this to Paul, who will carry on. Thanks, Deanna. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Crow. I'm chair of the Department of Humanities, and I also sit on the steering committee for the Institute for the Humanities, which is one of the supporters of today's events. Um, I should also mention that uh, most recently we, we, were, we had the honor of uh, hosting a visiting scholar from, uh, from India, Professor Valerian Rodriguez, who, uh, who taught our first ever course uh, on on, uh, on on the Dalits and their literature history, um, and so we were thrilled to have him here um, for a short time, and I hope to visit him at some point uh, in the future. So, uh, first, I would like to formally acknowledge the the individuals and and groups who have supported today's event. Uh, we have co-sponsors: the Chetna Association of Canada, of course, the Department of Asian Studies, UBC. The Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation in Buddhism and Contemporary Society, the Dr. Hari Sharma Foundation, and our own Institute for the Humanities. And the Institute has done a lot of work over more than three decades uh, in terms of community outreach. The belief being that the university should be permeable and that that uh, people within the university should interact with communities outside and people outside the universities coming into the university, as we have here today. Uh, so um, now I have the privilege of introducing our, our honored guest, and uh, I'll say a few words. There are many words that I could say. I looked, I looked you up before I came over and was <laughs> shocked. I thought, I can't say all of that, but I will. I, I do have a, a short piece here, and I'd like to just say that Dr. Uh, Suraj uh, Yengde is an award-winning scholar, an activist from India, and the author of Caste Matters, which was published on July 22nd, 2019, and within a week, right, it went to another printing. So if you want a copy, order now and wait patiently. Um, I'll, be, I'll be ordering one. He is an inaugural postdoctoral fellow at the in Initiative for Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability, the Shorstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Dr. Yangde is India's first Dalit PhD holder from an African university and has published in the field of caste, race, ethnicity, studies, and interregional labor migration in the global south. So uh, without any further ado, I think what we'll do is get the, the discussion going. And I would encourage you to feel free to participate. Uh, as Deanna said, we have a microphone, and we'll hand it around before you begin speaking. Um, all right. So off we go. Yeah. <laughs> How would you like to? We can start off with you, maybe. <coughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Maninder. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you, SFU Library, uh, and more importantly, thank you to the community uh, who has made. You know, it's a Friday. And they have to work, uh, and most likely they have taken day off. I think, which means they value uh, the institution as well as the people working in the institution. Um, as well as um, uh, what the institution as an educational repository or educational enterprise carries with it. Um, which is to say, um, I would like to thank Chetna Foundation, uh, the SFU Library, as well as Institute of Humanities, um, and other partners, UBC, uh, Asia Studies, um, and, you know, I was very surprised and in a way uh, uh, pleasantly surprised that there were so many uh, co-sponsors to this event. You know, usually 
uh, we all know when we do events, um, sometimes it's very difficult to get <laughs> even an additional sponsor to just even you know have their name if they don't. But looking at the list of the people, I was almost uh, confident that I may not remember all of them. And yesterday somehow I did, I skipped mentioning most of them and I just uh, called out. So just a shout out to uh, you know everybody. Um, and more importantly, I would like to recognize uh, the the women from the community who are here. Uh, because I think they have been here yesterday and there today and I'm sure they will be there for a few days and I think that's quite a telling fact of uh, this community as well as the the movement that they are uh, part of and so I would like to acknowledge uh, the leadership of Chetna, uh, the president as well as Jay for, uh, for leading this uh, conversation. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about, sorry I was, I, I should have, and this is just for the recording, right? It's not, for <laughs> so also congratulations <laughs> for graduating. Let's give it up. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, that, that uh, for also the visuals, that feels good to have someone with, <laughs> that makes me feel <laughs> special. <laughs> it's almost like Game of Thrones operating on a different <laughs> level. <laughs> um, uh, we, I would like to also uh, uh, recognize the excellent students uh, who are actually uh, taken upon themselves to do this. And I think uh, I don't remember any other institution, uh, to my knowledge, in the world uh, who is at the institution in any university outside India who is running a reading group after Ambedkar or his writings in devoted, you know, try to understand his politics <coughs> as well as through his politics, the Dalit politics, the caste politics and the politics of transnationalism. Because this is basically what it is about and how the humanistic values of Ambedkar come to the fore either it, through it be the political participation as well as through the, uh, the Buddhist project that he brings forth. And I think this is, this is a very uh, important uh, segment. Um, in understanding Ambedkar. Uh, so I acknowledge you all uh, and, and thank you for, for doing this. I really hope that because there has never been an effort on a campus level to actually address the issue of caste. Now you might have remembered, I mean, I will give example of America because that's what I know little bit about. I don't know much about Canada uh, and maybe you will educate me. You know, we have the, we had this immigration sort of in 1960 onwards in America, where um, you know, and um, a person with certain qualifications, uh, uh, they were they were you know given a direct entry and they were given they were assimilated into the American immigration uh, system, and so the 1960s uh, immigration that that came forth uh, brought with it professional class people. You know, they were doctors, they were engineers, and, and also people from various shades and colors of professional hierarchies and ranking. And so many of them also came as students uh, and who are, you know, now in their 60s, 70s uh, in, in, in U.S. when I meet them. And they also had a purpose. Some of them were nationalists. Uh, th some of them were uh, believing in a nation that is of diversity. Some of them said... Uh, a nation is for people who are working class, who are poor. And some of them said, well, nation is about what independence has given us, now it is upon ourselves. So there was various interpretations of a country. And basing on that, there was another important movement that went along with these political ideologies, which was the religious movement. And that religious movement came through various, uh, you know, uh, through various uh, waves. It came through spiritualism, it, it came through the, the hippie kind of Californian experience of, of exploring the world or through the, the, the kind of a ganja uh, uh, oriented uh, uh, side of finding a certain solace. Um, then there was a yoga and then we always had this spiritual gurus who actually made their ways uh, into, uh, you know, the Western most likely, the, when I say North American, I mean so the American US context. <clears throat> and these movements took place whatever happened in India they were reacting to that and it was very important and one of the important interventions happened was when the declared emergency happened uh, through Indira Gandhi 
and many movements uh, along that line uh, were you know united it was a moment for people who believed in the promises of democracy and people who were nationalist as well as people who were on the left and extreme left front as well as people who were moderates they thought uh, they need to come together and that movement was short lived but it lived it brought out a very positive ways of looking at uh, a a participatory uh, democratic nation and how it kind of excludes its own citizens in its own framework of post colonial nationalism then we had the naxal movement uh, which was which was uh, extreme left which was inspired by mao and that left movement had its own supporters and most of them were uh, uh, there were two categories of people one of them were people who were in universities these were intellectual class uh, which was inspired by the promises of global socialism global leftism they were part of that and global leftism also included uh, talking about people from in you know, from the third world politics from the global south or from the people who are also uh, not included in the project of uh, gl- globalism by talking about uh, environment politics it was a politics you know which you can you know and and, and it went it worked well with the kind of uh, punk kind of anarchic trade unionisms as well as the moderate left trade unionism so it was a confluence of that that worked out uh, into formulating uh, their own thoughts and the student activism that was around you know especially 1970s across the world many of them you know who know history or some would have lived that era maybe at uc berkeley the uc institutions or across in france and anywhere algeria uh, or india the the international influences actually played an important part in this so when we are looking at this various influences 1960s 1970s 1980s people were asking for democracy of a certain form and of course then there was a one group which was very much leninist in its thinking which said democracy is useless it's not going to provide to us because democracy is a uh, is a, uh, a to use the word uh, in a very loose language they would use it's a prostitute of ruling class they will use it whenever they want it when they don't want democracy the the bourgeoisie class will come who is the ruling class and will you know use democracy for its own benefit the day it will not serve its purpose it will say democracy is gone so we had this uh, variant sort of uh, uh, debates that 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 were taking place then in the 1990s the neo liberal order was actually holding its you know strong so one intellectual class provided a a a kind of intellectual support uh, but also they some of them went to field the second group was the working class people these were mostly immigrants as well as the people who were first generation second generation people working in society they were working in various kinds of jobs but they believed in the promises of a socialist order so there were two categories of people who were working on this 1990 onwards what happened was when we see through the imf as well as world bank kind of policies which were which were actually forcing the developing world or the underdeveloped world to buy loans and that was a huge kind of problem now we see this phase and now we have the politics of climate change uh, which which we also is reframed is reframed as environmental justice the ecological uh, acceptance as well as ecological accessibility of people from various class and groups however in this historical phase one thing was missing and it was intentionally missing that was a concentration on addressing the issue of caste caste never featured in this various dynamic movements which are operating almost like slabs in the time frame they talked about nationalism they talked about socialism they talked about anarchism trade unionism student movements uh, the world bank politics the globalization anti globalization politics we had a we had a huge march of world economic uh, social forum here in seattle one thing was actually very much suppressed the decolonial politics the environmental politics nobody talked about this issue and i think some of these groups who are here from 1970s onwards who have been organizing this actually were present and the evidence is they are present even here that means they have been here for more than 40 50 years and they have not left they have not let it go from their own aspirations of what an anti caste politics looks like 
but nobody paid an adequate attention to their efforts to their very ground up efforts these were poor people these were working class people these people didn't had any religious institutions they didn't had gurudwara they didn't had temples they didn't had mosque to kind of support they just got together few families few people and yet were creating an intervention into an hegemonic politics of the subaltern it's a very important thing because the subalterns who were the elites back in india or whatever the background it is they were still hegemonizing they were still dominating they were still holding control on this population even in that these groups made a dent and made sure that it will not die and the effect of that is we have statue here at sfu uh, york university ubc and you know this kind of activities that are taking place is not an outcome of an immediate some sort of uh, working it is a concentrated work that has been happening long and i, and I acknowledge uh, or i would like to congratulate the sfu and the leadership uh, for really taking into consideration this very important uh, demography of the world 300 million people their histories their aspirations their politics their internal contradictions the kind of social conditions they are put into that is a guiding principle for the world geographies how the social as well as political geographies are made and crafted and when i say geography i just don't mean to say in a spatial sense i mean to say in political sense i want to say in economic sense how this group anchored themselves in a radical political framework yet not immediately siding with the left politics or the right politics any religious politics or atheist politics they remained firm in what they believed was correct to their own lived experiences and doing something that is not only helpful for students from various uh, countries but it is also helpful for faculties as well as the uh, the the administration because from there you can learn as to what is happening and it is not a issue of india because that's i think one of the very much of a uh, uh, um, a sort of oft repeated discourse that uh, this is an indian issue it is not uh, you know uh, uh, it is as much a canadian issue as much an american issue as much as you know wherever this population have gone so when we think of european migration to the new world the problems that white people brought to the new world were not mentioned it as being a european problem it became an american problem it became a canadian problem it became south african problem or australian problem similarly the immigration from the subcontinent that has happened is cannot be easily subsided by declaring oh that is an indian problem why are you bringing it here it is as much as a population that has happened because the social forces have made it possible for such kind of system to thrive there are conditions in operation in which operation persists it's like the parasite you need to provide that conditions for it to grow these social forces in various countries offered that and one of the shortcomings was that the universities did not pay enough attention to this sociological or anthropological phenomenon had they been taken into consideration maybe there would have been more interesting inter kind of uh, not only research oriented dialogue but also action uh, packed uh, kind of discussions and and discourses because i think it is here where it becomes important that if you have to understand and you know contribute to society society is actually reacting and challenging the very narrative so whatever we actually uh, uh, convene to to do this doing through an institutional formation not only helps our own research projects it not only helps our own next uh, uh, kind of intellectual contributions but it also helps us to uh, deconstruct to speak in deridan sense it literally deconstructs from top to bottom about whatever theoretical constructs or misunderstandings we had because it is a new intervention it is a new policy it is a new logic that might help us to actually loosen our own grips on certain established social norms and social theories and i think this is an exciting opportunity for all of the students as well as everybody who is here and as regarding book that book actually comes out of that same tradition it is trying to make a dent it is trying to challenge the suppressed voices of people who have never who had never given an adequate opportunity 
who were never considered as fellow human beings, who were never considered intelligent enough, smart enough, vocal enough, and even these were the people who were content, constantly uh, telling uh, the Dalits as well as other lower caste people that your worth is only limited into certain vocation. But what happens here is they challenge everything, they break the vocation, they, they become directors, they become professors, they become uh, government servants and they become uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And, and you know, in that kind of sentiments, uh, this book tries to fill it. it. It talks about various issues of how caste matters. It focuses on almost every other uh, 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 okay, uh, logic of caste it is it is talking about how brahmins themselves are trapped into caste system how dalits are forced into the caste system how there is a co-optation as well as there is a refusal from a dalit community it's a very vibrant mass of people there are uh, as i said 300 million people belonging to all religion of india and yet these are the people who are taking the politics of uh, 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 thank you thank you the, taking the politics of uh, anti-casteism to the front. This is a new generation now. You know, uh, we are not afraid. Uh, we are not going to go down. We are not going to be talked down. And we are not going to be schooled about what is our or what needs to be done. You know, we are independent. Uh, we are smart enough. And we believe what is better for us will be decided by us and not by the other people who are oppressing us or harassing us. We are not anymore going to accept whatever the other oppressor is going to tell us as the truth. We are going to make double, triple, three times, four times inquiries into whatever they are saying because the suspicion is still on, 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 the, on, on the front. And I think this is only be made possible because we have still hold on to our creative methods of uh, challenging anything that comes in an undemocratic fashion, which is, it could be a violence. It could be a refusal to, uh, to, to accept us as equal citizens. Yet we are trying to challenge whatever is, whatever is brought for, forth to us. So there are various class issues that operate within Dalit and within the caste spectrum. And Dalits in India, they operate in a very closed nutshell of a caste system. They just don't have escape out of it. Even if they try, something else will, like, like an octopus's fang, it will just uh, pull you down and try to... Uh, 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 you know, interpret your experiences into different lengths. So, when whatever what happened to us was actually theorized by Brahmins or other dominant caste people. They wrote about us. They described what Dalit experiences are. And many a times, they misunderstood and they misreported. By doing that, what they did was they got themselves good salaries, they got some good grants, they got some good promotions. But the project of our independence, our liberation, was never put forward. So, Dalit movement right now is not asking for assimilation, it's not asking for the limited avenues of freedom. It is asking for a total liberation. Liberation from any sorts of oppression, be it religious, be it class, and be it any other form of subcaste uh, 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 discrimination. So I think uh, this book attempts to talk it in a language that needs to be talked. It's not, it's not trying to convince anybody uh, in a language of compromise or, or you know, give us a shelter. It is, it, is, it is a straightforward statement. We have got an opportunity and I think this is an opportunity we will not leave because it is after so much struggle we have gotten it. And, and, and it's only, it's only uh, valid and it only makes sense for us to uh, uh, utilize this for the best of all and you know, spread uh, the messages of love, compassion and inhumanity that the Dalit community has been practicing for so long. Thank you. So I think at this point we want to uh, open a discussion. Yeah. Uh, so I can begin. you want to begin? Uh, all right. So uh, thank you very much, Suraj, for that lovely intro. And uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, very quickly introduce myself. My name is Harsh. Um, uh, I, along with a few other people, started the reading group that he was mentioning, uh, uh, the Ambedkar Reading Group. And we've had a lot of support from Chetna. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that and it's been great to have this space available for us to have these discussions like you said really important to counter casteism in a university setting and of course we have to think about it in terms of uh, you know not just as Indian issues right like Ambedkar himself said that uh, as long as caste exists anywhere that Indians go caste will go with them and that has been the case over the last almost 100 years of migration as as Indians have gone out uh, into other places in the world 
just but going back to the text uh, just for the moment bef- before we go into other things uh, just to talk about the book a bit more and um, uh, as as you read that uh, review of yours by another reading group from uh, JNU uh, it was I'm just wondering um, what was your opinion on that and basically what it was it was this review that was saying that uh, Suraj was advocating for anti-constitutionalism in a few ways uh, and they were saying that basically by going the anti-constitutional route, you were no longer sticking to what Ambedkarism was. And I'm really interested in seeing what your opinions are on that and whether or not an Ambedkarite resistance, anything has necessarily have to be constitutional. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Harsh. Uh, and thank you for bringing back the discussion to uh, caste matters. Um, you know, um, I did not read the review in its entirety uh, because uh, when I uh, when I got the uh, when the I think the review was out, uh, it was not a, a review basically. It was a, 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 a response uh, to certain uh, issues, you know, um, and so, uh, and so I was actually I was in a, I was on a I was on a tour in India, a speaking tour. And so th- at that specific moment, I was in Nagpur, and you know, uh, whenever I go to uh, you know India, uh, almost every day that I am in there in that country, uh, there are talks, and most of the time it's two talks per day. And that day it were four talks. One one was a TV interview, so I was totally drowned, and so I I barely could uh, read. And then uh, because it was in Nagpur, Nagpur is a very uh, hot uh, space for this kind of conversations because also many other things and the Dalit politics is very, very active uh, in in that in that space. So I couldn't uh, unfortunately read and uh, and what happened was after that also I couldn't read uh, because uh, for some reason uh, and but then you know some people actually uh, sent me that uh, this is what is happening and what you said is you know the summary. And then, whatever I I, um, I got out of people's uh, comments and sentiments, I think uh, there is a bit of a fear in the minds of you know uh, Dalit uh, population that uh, uh, that whatever new ideas are going to come are going to challenge the status quo. What we need to do is we need to understand that every new movement needs new methods. It needs to sometimes eradicate certain methods that are not working for you. And you have to develop new methods. That is the evolutionary dynamics of any organizing. You can't rely on the methods, for example, that were applicable 2000 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, it has to change because the problems are also changing. You know, certain things remain stagnant, but the operation are, they are finding new ways. And so the anti-constitutionalism is something I am yet to understand where did they get that from or whoever got that from and I I would like to meaning what I would like to do is what people should uh, you know uh, engage with the text and try to find out where are these sentiments coming from like where did you got that now apparently there was an excerpt of a book published in the newspaper Hindu and uh, you all know, you know, our excerpts are, you know, when the book is out, the excerpt, the, the, the paper, newspaper or magazines or whatever, uh, e-websites, they, they publish excerpts. So the excerpt was talking about, the, t- the title was, uh, relying on constitution is not enough. That was how the, you know, and you all know how, how, how it goes, because uh, they, they are looking for clickbaits. But also, you know, they are, the newspaper's purpose is to be provocative. So they they did what is best in their, you know, uh, and, and they did. And they were successful. They were provocative. And it helped me <laughs> uh, in, in various ways. Uh, when I say me, I mean the, the kind of the cause we are trying to find out. And I think, I don't know what, uh, what segment of that article... Uh, they found objectionable. I mean, did you, did you, would you? They, they just mentioned that there was an excerpt and uh, they, they, they were basically saying that, I think it was more in relation to your work with Yeltham there, 
also the radical and Ambedkar, and they were they were sort of I think also cumulating the two, which were also got me very confused. I mean, you're not the only, you're not alone in the confusion. I mean, many of us are confused. Because what happens is, you see, uh, the Dalit community is actually undergoing through a, a phase. Because in the 21st century, it is the early decades of 21st century. And so what happened is, for so long, for so long, this community was existing, but it was not contributing uh, to certain innovative projects that were recognizable, that were not meant, that were not acknowledged, that were not you know given a kudos or high five good that you are doing. So what happens is there is a suddenly after India's constitution 1950 onwards, uh, in uh, in a generation we have so many educated Dalits. Comparatively, they are less with the Dalit population, but in the office spaces and all, it was not uh, it was unexpected. Like how come the the Brahminical system? I never expected this many Dalits to get the opportunity that constitution offered to them. They thought these people will still be dangling around. They will not be. And But suddenly within uh, uh, one generation or two generation, uh, the Dalits who were Ambedkarites more specifically, they did one thing. They invested heavily in their children and their children's education. They said do nothing but go to school. And whatever money, whatever everything they had, they gave it to education. They followed what Ambedkar told them. The Dalits who were not Ambedkarites, for example, who didn't believe in Ambedkar, who were still Hindu untouchables, they were still, uh, you know, living in a different world. They were yet not to reach Ambedkar's formula of how education is important. So many of them still were like, you know, education. They were living in a very pessimistic life because you understand Dalits have close to 1200 subcastes across India, you know, and each subcaste has its own way of looking at their own liberation. So some, some people were still like, religion is our way, where can we go? You know, uh, 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 the Ramayana is written by some one of us or uh, the religious texts are one of us, we don't want to. So there was a lot of uh, confusions ar around, around, ar ar around this time. And what that did was, in a few decades time, Dalits are now in surplus. Because it's a, it's a monumental achievement. Because in one generation you give them opportunity, you give them a reservation, affirmative action. You 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 know recognize their whatever limited talent they have, uh, whatever limited avenues you have with their talent, and then there is a huge mass that is excited, that is there to show the enthusiasm that they want to do something for the community, and they literally want to prove that we are also here. Please give us recognition because so far nobody recognized us. Now you see that's the politics where at, we are at a phase where this kind of surplus is existing but the system is not yet ready to co-opt or actually take into uh, you know what to do with this surplus. And this is what is happening with the kind of reactions we get to any kind of political formulations. Because there is so much of enthusiasm and there is so much of energy. This kind of a intellectual surplus as well as human surplus that we have. Um, is actually trying to make its inroads, make its in way uh, into this. And I think that's how the reactions to whatever you do uh, uh, would come. And I think uh, I'm not surprised that there are such reactions because every change, uh, uh, you know, uh, will have an equal and opposite reaction. At least that's how I would, I would think about it. Um, thanks, Suraj. Um, I was thinking about the title of your book and um, how much it resonates with Cornel West's um, Race Matters, which was written at a time in the 90s. Uh, it was pathbreaking, um, really kind of, uh, there was an urgency and something about his writing, it still resonates today. Um, and so I wondered if you could say a bit about how you see your book in relation to this idea of like urgency and also how you think about caste intersectionally through the lens of race, class, gender, sexuality, um, and sort of how that feeds into the way that you're thinking about the structure of the book. Thank you, Sasha. I think, you know, caste as a phenomena doesn't uh, operate on a stand alone. You know, it cannot. It has all this intersectionalities to, to kind of uh, plug in uh, uh, Crenshaw because that intersectionality that we have right now is what is uh, you know making it uh, surface uh, constantly again and again so caste is 
going along with gender, with class, with sexuality and all other forms of oppression. It's a meeting point of all the disadvantages that human societies have created upon other humans. And I think that if we clear it, then it becomes a very interesting understanding of how do we address caste. Because caste cannot be tackled caste or gender, caste or class, caste or sexuality, caste or you know religion. No, it has to be caste, comma, religion, comma, comma, comma. Because that's that's how it is. And if you have to identify what kind of operation caste brings forth, it is operation of every sort. <laughs> Everybody is part of it. If you are if it's a caste tree, you know, whatever shadow through whatever fissures we are getting, they are coming through the caste lens. And that uh, kind of uh, the various branches of this tree we have, they have made sure that they remain invisible when caste is taking operation is taking place. So when if it's a caste operation, it's operation of women. It's operation based on poor people. You know, it's operation of, you know, and also uh, uh, the uh, the overarching definition of, you know, uh, uh, caste or class, you know, there is always a fight. And the, the left movement was actually prioritizing much on class because that's how Marx told them that the, the, the kind of class divisions that we have in society, they are they give rise to various other problems and frederick you know uh, angels wrote about the family life and how it is you know in a capitalist society it's a problematic you know how, how family is actually supporting the how capitalist order regulates the family life among many other arguments now in in indian context caste is like a seed whatever disadvantages or operations we have it's coming out of that we have to centrally understand that until unless we frame that nucleus on caste effectively, we will be not able to expand our own theoretical understanding of caste-based violence and caste-based oppression. Ambedkar probably was the earliest thinkers to put caste into a gender lens. You know, he was a young college, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, graduate student. At Columbia, in Columbia, he you know his famous paper, which was later, of course, published. I mean, I mean, one have to imagine uh, you are presenting a paper in a class for a seminar class, and that paper getting accepted into an academic peer review journal. That means, you know what I mean? Like we all can relate to that, right? I mean, we give so many presentations, and yet uh, four or five years down the line, the reviewers are uh, you know being nasty and all in their reviews. So that paper, what Ambedkar essential argument was which was cast in India very interesting read very very uh, thorough uh, kind of examination of, of and you know Ambedkar kind of gives a, 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 a an anti-orientalist critique of the western uh, scholars who interpret caste through their own lenses he's like you know and that's a very uh, and so people have not paid attention to Ambedkar when they wrote about orientalism for example you know Ambedkar is here way before even you think he's critiquing that whole and and he is writing he make into an intellectual uh, uh, argument that is not just on a surface level that is just not saying you are wrong you are bad he is giving reasons that's a very classical understanding of orientalism and one has to really examine how orientalism of edward said or any other orientalism that we had fits into the project of ambedkar's caste in india and just an analysis of that will be perhaps one of the you know uh, interesting kind of confluences we will see so Ambedkar argues that it is upon the operation of women that caste system thrives. Operation of women ends, the pathways of caste will end, caste operation will end. So if you have to be an anti-casteist, we have to be, you know, anti-sexist. We have to be anti uh, all the forces that are, you know, making sure the operation of women is alive and they are thriving. If that operation of women ceases to exist, then the because see women are the uh, the the muted subjects or made mute subjects of caste order women's agency doesn't matter to them because women are the reproducing units they are the factories 
who are going to reproduce caste purities and how do you uh, how do you control what you want to produce is by making that body irrelevant so the women were made wretched bodies of this uh, caste uh, you know ecology so women didn't had a, a recognized significance in the system and by doing that what they did was they used punishments the laws that were existing uh, be it manusmriti or various other religious texts you know they made sure that women were put on the same pedestal as animals or you know even you talk about ramayana or other so called spiritual text you will see how operation of women is centralizing but it gets vicious through the text like manusmriti which becomes a law of land for so long even before that women is again subordinate subject through the casteist order a woman loses her independence that buddha grants them in the counter revolutionary dynamics of the uh, the emergence of brahminism woman then then goes back to what her level was elevated to you know of course buddha also had his own uh, 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 blinders uh, uh, where he himself was also uns- uh, un- uh, unsure of women's presence in his in his own order of course it, it it was his wife and i think mother or aunt aunt actually who actually fought for their equal presence in that he had to accept but that same recognition couldn't happen and so that order continues so when we talk about operation of women in india what are you talking about the feminist in india the brahmin feminist trying to save their own brahmin men and dominant caste men they misdirect the entire attention to uh, uh, stealing the theories from the west of the feminist archetypes they have very rarely paid attention to the brahminic patriarchy that operates the brahminism that brings patriarchal sensibilities is normalized in its everyday action you are patriarchal you are sexist you are misogynist and yet you are a neutral man there is no punitive measures to you because being a man in a caste society is to be an anti woman and men boys from their young age onwards are taught to be a strong male character of a alpha kind of character and how do you emphasize your manliness is by ensuring the denigration of women by making sure the subordination of women body animates into making your manliness you are not a complete man unless there is a sub Uh, subordinate woman caste society has given rise to this for so long that it has legitimized its existence and so the people who should have instead gotten into this historical construction of gendered uh, binaries and looking at how caste played a important role they gave us a 100 year old or 200 year old interpretation of colonial construction of gender or whatever that field that helped them to you know evade the responsibilities of their own ancestors and i think this uh, book uh, about uh, uh, cornell west and uh, 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 race matters is um, we had few titles we just wanted a easy title and um, i was in constant conversation with cornell west uh, i mean during the phase of book writing not as much he didn't know uh, but uh, he had read my book proposal about 3 years ago and you know he immediately said you know they should go into you know you should start now working on it and uh, his book was you know i mean cornell west wrote so many books but race matters becomes almost like you know he's author of race matters among other 20 books that's how they say it you know <laughs> and so uh, we all know how important influential race matters has been it's a small book uh, written in a very eloquent i mean i can't even imagine i mean of course he wrote it for various magazines and various journals and from there it's a compilation but it was written after the attacks in in la uh, which had a significant moment cast matters has a purpose it is trying to blow the structures of caste operations the caste structures as well as the culturalism of caste and so i mean he's uh, in my in my uh, american edition or also second edition uh he i mean he was supposed to write a foreword he was late but it is going to come he wrote a foreword to the book also 
but also I was playing with the idea of a caste souls coming, taking it from the Du Bois, the souls of black folk, because you know, and and me and I had him discussed, and then he said caste matters <laughs> goes well. I said okay, yeah. I mean, for me it was uh, l- less of a title because also I did not want it to give the title caste matters, the life of da 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 da. da. You know, we have subtext kind of. I was just not interested in that. I just wanted people to pick up the book, cast matters, okay, why does it matter, why does it not matter, how it is, read, read, read. Um, and uh, this book went through a lot of phases. It went through, and as every other book, you know, it, it goes through rewriting like so many times, and so it went at least twice. It was a very jargon-specific book. It was very riddled with humanistic jargons, uh, and I had hoped to, you know, draw on from the European school of, you know, especially Hannah Arendt and, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, and as well as the early... Uh, 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 Greek philosophy, uh, but uh, it would not have served the purpose, as people said, and 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 so it was a difficult task. How do you maintain the academic integrity in a text that is written in a softer language or a toned-down language? And that was my, that's why it took a little bit more time. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, just going off on a bit of a tangent here, um, you, uh, you mentioned the term Brahminical Patriarchy and that immediately reminded me of what happened last year or a couple of years ago when uh, the CEO of Twitter was in India and he was having a meeting with people from Equality Labs and uh, one of the members from that activist group basically held up a poster that was that said smash brahminical patriarchy and then it just became the, it just blew up on indian twitter where basically these where you could just see outright casteism and it was like the top trending thing uh on twitter in india at least uh if not worldwide where it was basically just all these twitter bots also of course we know how they you know interact with the government and the ruling party and things like that and basically saying that oh twitter needs to apologize for this there is no such thing as brahminical patriarchy and i was also just sort of thinking about our conversation last night when you were mentioning something about being pessimistic about social media and dalits uh so i was wondering if you could just maybe talk a bit about that thank you thank you Harsh, for that question i mean you know uh, the uh, because, because due to the absence of uh, uh, due to the absence of um, uh, uh, any media in the Dalit lives and the intervention of media, Dalits are looking at social media as a new channel and new avenue. But you know, if you put that social media as a godsend panacea, you are wrong. Uh, you are outrightly wrong because that's too much trust given to a company that works on profits and profits based on people that are there to exploit your emotions you know we all know what what ai is doing the artificial intelligence and how algorithms actually force you to consume the ads or to consume the content that you are not interested in also in you know and what that does is that actually is playing with your mind it's a very vicious game many people are not able to understand what is going behind this silicon valley corporatism it's a proper control it's almost like a zombie generation that they will create uh, if 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 it is not tackled very soon, and I think that nuances need to be understood, especially by the poorest of the poor from the community, because of course having an access, and this is what the Modi government did, it gave free internet, you know, for people to, but it was not for their purpose. It was serving their own political purpose, but also serving their their corporate masters, you know, who are you know helping them in various ways. Social media language of social media is very much it's it's a new language you understand you can't write the same language that you write in book on social media you'll not even get a like for your post you have to change the content and by doing that what you are also doing is you're changing the content of your own movement and sometimes that doesn't go well sometimes that doesn't relate to each other this is where we need to pay attention See, the movement like BAMSAFE, which was working for and still operates, they have their own, you know, worked out formulas. Now, converting that into social media is a very ex- exciting exercise and we should do it. But if we bring about a social media developed movement to think that change is going to bring, 
I think that's a, I think um, a slight uh, expect, uh, extra expectation from a from a system that is not going to serve your purpose. And we have to understand that these companies are not a utopia. The Dalits wholesome trust into this is a very fearsome thing. Some Dalits are right now, especially Adivasi activists, are are challenging Twitter to give them a verified status. I mean, how much of a you know uh, limited it has become that they are fighting on social media to expect. And you know, social media world is important for education, but it also it is important for miseducation. <laughs> it is important for information, but it is also playing its part in misinformation. And the whole violence we have, the pogroms we have, the ethnic you know, tragedies we have, is an outcome of that misinformation project that is happening. So Dalits are, are also facing that. They are also part of that. And that's fearing uh, for the entire community. You see. So if Twitter did that or any other community did that, there has to be a certain organic efforts to, to understand that. And now, it acknowledges a language that is written in a certain style. For example, let's see. Now, if you are writing in Hindi, for example, you need to write in the Hindi that is very much written in a newspaper style or, you know, there is always that kind of tension. Now, if I write in a Hindi or a normal person, for example, not me, but, uh, uh, you know, any other person who is not well versed in, you know, education with the kind of education he or she has, you are not going to get the same kind of recognition. And what is happening is people are using that for immediate reactions. Twitter or social media is demanding an immediate reaction. Certain things, of course, demand equal reaction. We, we important, you know, there is a violence and we need to take action. But in a movement perspective, or how do you develop a narrative or a contra-narrative of a system that is actually asking you to immediately respond? It's not going to be easy. It's always going to be a difficult task. It's, it's always going to ask you to, uh, you know, rush to find certain answers. And I think this is a worrisome social media... Uh, 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 ethics are not yet known to the world you know by doing that I don't mean to say that Dalits should get off social media of course not or they should not you know but they should not look it as the ultimate virtue you know uh, there are various ways we, which we can still utilize to uh, you know gain from traditional methods also now if you have a little bit of capital you know if you make a project start your own newspaper for example no, or start a start a e space for example you know i think these are the kind of avenues that needs to be explored but we will see again uh, which social media world is a world of reactions there is a world of certain clickbaits i want someone to tweet my tweet for 1000 times someone wants to tweet for 3000 times and you see there is a lot of uh, urgency there is a lot of negativity oh i tweeted and nobody likes so, some people actually call hey i posted this why don't you like my tweet <laughs> you know so that that's how it has become and if you don't like it there is a problem okay he has a problem with me maybe i did him wrong thing two or two months ago maybe he's taking a revenge by not commenting on this it has really created a a very uh, you know uh, and once it happened once my friend actually called me and he's like did is everything all right i said yes what is with you he said yeah, everything but you know i just want to make sure you are okay with me i said yes he said you know i i posted something on whatsapp and I never got your response in a group. So I'm wondering if everything is okay. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, even that is changing the influences of your social media uh, kind of, you know. And many people, for example, are connected on social media, but they have not met each other. <laughs> you know? And and so, what happens when you meet? Uh, you know, because by social media, we've already talked to each other so much. We have shared ideologies so much. And, you know... And this this is where I you know I I, I wrote about this uh, this intimacy of screen, you know uh, the 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 kind of intervention to screen has become so intimate that even we are trying to find our partners, which is not a bad thing. I just want to say, but you know uh, you know I wrote a review of a book uh, of a film where it was actually asking us to uh, uh, accept it the way it is not. Social media is trying to create that addition. What about your filters? We have all of these things, you know. It is it is actually asking us to change the temporary perspective that you have. It is not giving a forever solution to that. 
We have new apps that make you look like, feel like young or apps that make you feel like old. So, you know, this is all a, a, a dynamic world which we have not yet even <coughs> visited in a critical lens. So, how do we address a whole structure of caste, anti-caste movement, anti-class movement by solely relying on that? We have to utilize it for our purpose, not falling into the trap of becoming the next, you know, whatever uh, thing and, and, and then, you know, uh, drowning it to peril. Because many companies or many groups or individuals have started their career out of social media, which is very good. But then you can't be, you then they claim to be the leader of the Dalit movement, the Dalit community, because just because they write good or they kind of read and well and they say, you know, I'm the, and then they get invited to various conferences and which is important. But what about other people who are not there on social media? What about other people who don't even, you know, who are working actually groundwork and this is what is happening. This is the laity of this ruling class people who actually want to just go on internet, do a search, okay, this person is very active, he or she has 100,000 followers, and maybe he must be very influential, she must be influential, they invite the person. Now, nothing wrong in that, but also there has to be acknowledgement that we have to do efforts which are beyond this. Could I presume to ask a question? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, all right. Um, currently, I'm teaching a course, hum Introduction <coughs> to the Humanities 101. I have about 100 students in the class. And they're from 19 different countries. Wow. And a big, uh, uh, an abiding theme in the course is um, learning to talk with each other, mm -hmm. not yell at each other. Uh, social media is, of course, a great way to shout at each other. Right. Um, and also to close ranks around what you believe and to shut out conversations from other places. So I, uh, we're talking about the importance of human contact across cultures, geographies, religions, and so on, languages. Um, and we opened my course with uh, a discussion of three of the Socratic dialogues, right? Mm. The Crito, mm. the Mino, and the Apology. Wow. And now we're dealing with or wow. looking at two, of two Hibbert lectures from 1930 that were given by Rabindranath Tagore. Okay. All right. So um, two questions. One, how, you, you mentioned referencing classical Greek thought in your book initially and kind of turning away from that. I'm curious... For the sake of my teaching, sure, sure. Um, how you how you approach that, or how you thought that contribution might work, and second, your impression on um, Tagore's stance vis-à-vis -vis Dalits and their position in society. I mean, we just spoke about uh, Brahma Samaj, the, this sort of universalism, this message of of a universal human being mm -hmm. uh, as a as a way of identifying with each other and opening dialogue. So, if you wouldn't mind just sure. responding to those, sure. yeah, very open-ended. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Paul. I think, I mean, I, I wish I sit, I can sit in your class because I think that sounds like a, a I mean, you know, um, it, it sounds like enablers, you know, kind of pointing out, and you know, uh, you know, I want to go into a classroom where I can yell. Yeah. You know. Oh, actually, that happened first day. <laughs> oh, you <it> did? <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> but also, you know, yelling is also part of a Socratic, you know, engagement, right? Um, and if, 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 if you make it a humanistic project of, you know, using our sensorials, whatever best we have, and, and deploy that to the advancement of certain common good, and, you know, what's wrong in that? You know, if I can yell good, I bloody yell, <laughs> you know, uh, or if I want to, you know. And so my book, for example, you know, uh, I wanted to look at, I mean, there is a little bit of, very little, actually, uh, uh, Plato here. Uh, but also my book actually talks, it mentions this, we need a Socratic dialogical experiences when we engage with the question of caste mm -hmm. and you know uh, socratic dialogue not just having a, a dialogue but also critical dialogue you know where uh, the idea of paideia you know uh, where Cornell West very affectionately talks about it the complete learning you know it's not just a cheap education and I think uh, the caste paideia complete education which is rooted in uh, you know understanding and learning more from each other's is 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 what I am trying to in an attempt, and that's why I wrote the last chapter, Brahmins against Brahminism, uh, because this is under the Socratic tradition. The Dalits have always had this tradition. You know, we have always believed in having conversations, learning from each other, and one of the best thing to understand realize is Dalits have filed behind all other reformers, or saints, or gurus who have come, 
and offered a new discourse of knowledge. Any religion you talk about in India, sub-religions, whatever, quote-unquote, sub-religions, Dalits have filed behind that. Be it Sikhism, uh, be it uh, Islam, uh, or be it other uh, peers and, and, you know, gurus and, you know, uh, 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 various other sects. Uh, the Dalits were, were there. You go in South, in Karnataka, Basava religion, Dalits are there. You go in Maharashtra, uh, the Dalits are there. In Punjab, and of course, we have examples. So, so Dalits have been always part of this. I just wanted to uplift that voice now and give it a refined, you know, because what happens is if you deal with an immediate threat, you don't see the larger picture. And many Dalits. Uh, or, 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 or non-Dalits who are criticizing me for the book for example have not looked at the larger picture and a person uh, who, re- who read uh, this book, he saw this uh, off repeat of uh, you know, uh, when I actually mentioned clearly you know, we need a Socratic dialogue in this book and then that's where he, he picked up okay, then that's what he's trying to do so he then understood, when I'm, when I'm being critical of Dalits for example excuse me, which is not very much but I'm there a little bit critical as much as it is about any other thing. That's part of the tradition. <laughs> you know, you can't have a monolithic voice. Uh, that is, because that is only going to give us a one-sided perspective. That is only going to uh, undernourish our own growth uh, intellectually as well as philosophically. And so, uh, when I'm, when I'm, you know, uh, for example, you know, I was, you know, Plato's, uh, uh, you know, the Republic, for example, you know, um, the famous quote until philosophers and kings and, you know, become the part uh, of, of, you know, they run the state and you know, equivalent of that ideology. I was thinking, how, how, do, I, how do I bring it back home? How, 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 do I, how do I consider? Now, what happened is, these philosophies have further complicated. For example, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Dazian of Heidegger, for example, you know, Aristotle, I mean, uh, Heidegger really constructs uh, Aristotle for us, <laughs> in a, in a, you know, uh, in a very good way. And I was thinking, how, how, how do I how do I characterize my, my beingness? And, and in that, I, I, I describe through, uh, you know, uh, through, the, through the beingness, you know, maybe I will, I will, I will devour in reading one, 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 one passage, if you will, about, about how, the, how the Dalits, which, I, which my chapter first title is itself called Being a Dalit. And I question the idea of what it means to be being. <laughs> you know, I am a Dalit. You know, there is a lot going on there. It, it's just not simply presenting, and and I and I have attempted to you know, um, to 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 talk about you know, in in being Dalit. You know, there is a whole definition of Dalit love, what Dalit love is, and how 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 it is an important construction. But one thing that continues to miss in our perspective is the universalism that these ideas bring to us. That's why I am I am more uh, you know. Uh, concern. For example, here, I will just read out. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a John, John Paul Sartre describes what it means to look for self in the eyes of others. It's almost a double consciousness, right? How you look at yourself. It is the other's perfection that we choose to prioritize while presenting ourselves. The other wants us to be like this, so we will condition upon like this. Whenever I'm writing this, apply the cast lens in this. How the dominant caste or oppressor caste or feudal caste is looking at it. Therefore, we constantly rehearse identity performances. Such repeated rehearsals add to the improvisation of how, of how one finally comes to declare oneself. This becomes my being without being for me. Meaning, I am here but it's not for me. I am just there. Meaning, I am someone but I am not the owner of myself in this particular moment of interaction between the oppressor who is seeing and the oppressed, the subject who is being seen. This happens, of course, what Sartre argues, because we give up the agency of ourself and willingly become an object for others. The audacity to giving up oneself comes from the historical experiences of punctuated fears that are interested, inserted in our minds and bodies. So Dalits are constantly conditioned. Not going into the details of Heidegger's conception of time being, time hyphen being, it is sufficient to note that according to him, one lives in a tightly formed time space and thus every action is codified according to one's action in a particular time. The question then arises is what about those humans who have no accurate registers of noting their presence in the time? 
my mother for example does not have a record of her birth she does not know when she was born the ownership of time here is a privileged description of the privileged beings so what i try to do is i try to bring bring it back home you know you know the whole conception of time is actually challenged through my mother she doesn't know when she was born many old generation people if you ask them when you were born they will say when it was raining <laughs> we, we the second day she was born you know and then the and because it it happened in schools so many of our date of births are given by our school teachers because that guy decided when we were born because and then the poor peasant or poor you know woman would go who is a manual scavenger for example uh, sir please register him okay tell date of birth uh, he will be like during that time no no you have to tell specifically put whatever you feel like is good for you but he was born you know this year so that's how you know we had that you know uh, the kind of experiences yeah please remind me your name again yeah um Hi, my name is Josephine. Um, uh, thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, I'm really excited to read your book. Um, I'm. Uh, I was wondering if you could um, just tell us a little bit about like your. I know this was like a long time, but like your time in the U.S. and like what that was like. Um, I'm from the U.S. originally, and like I'll be. You know, I've been in Canada for the last five years, but I'll be probably going back at some point, and just I'm much more. Um, yeah w- would be curious about like how like you kind of like um connected like the dalit struggle with like other like race class and gender struggles and just like what kind of like the reception has been and like what like um yeah just like how like you've managed to like yeah connect that to like just like larger like and like also the those other things to the dalit struggle and yeah where do you come from Josephine? i'm um, from berkeley berkeley Oakland. okay okay Thank you for asking that question, Joseph. And I think you know one of my purposes is to connect because that has unfortunately not happened. The Dalit community or Dalit movement, Dalit experiences should have been part of other larger global solidarity struggles. It is but a natural thing. You know, if you are talking about gender rights in certain context, it's a natural thing for you to fight for the the rights of these people. Similarly, if you are fighting for certain you know class issues or you know various internal issues it is important for me you know uh, the fortunate thing was ambedkar was already in contact with the leaders of african american movement during his time you know one of the best thing is you know one of the best record is him's connection with du bois uh, you know the two giants and that actually gave me more strength because uh, if i have to loosely compare Uh, du Bois is like the Ambedkar of American intellectuals, and so Ambedkar is here and Du Bois is here, and so I saw it when I was, you know, mentioning Du Bois. The scholars of black, especially at Harvard, would give more attention because, you know, Du Bois is a very important intellectual, <laughs> you know, and then that's where I got, you know, that that's where it was a hook that. Uh, and and they did not know about ambedkar they did not know about untouchables and so they had heard somewhere but not at all about ambedkar and you know some people were like yeah we know but not much and that's where uh, you know i started uh, uh, getting involved in uh, social uh, especially black lives matter movement i took the black lives matter activist to india we started a movement there in india called black dalit and black power movement we started it in university of hyderabad where rohit vemulas uh you know was was forced to commit a suicide which we call institutional murder um and so that was a statement we started that i think 3 years ago where we were like you know we are part of this and so i also got uh the the queer activist black activist who is a decolonial colonized activist from 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 uk to come down to india and 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 again what i aimed was to bring scholars from different colors shades and varieties to come to india on the conference on ambedkar so i did that in 2 years ago where we tried to get roma scholars we tried to get scholars from indigenous communities uh, unfortunately i had no contact here in canada but next time i would like to get some of their leaders come down and some of our representatives as well people come down here and we also got palestinian activists interested so we wanted to create this kind of a, a uh because they are not they are interested people are interested to know but they just don't know how to work and so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a it's a, in a way 
uh, isolating experience sometimes <laughs> because you are talking about something which people don't know much about. People don't know how to connect with you, how to how to bridge this gap. And so, uh, one of the things I thought was to connect with them and asking them to at least visit India. If not, let's do an informal dialogue or let's have a uh, Dalit or Black Lives Matter a symposium where we will discuss the entire day on how to fight this operation, how to how to you know uh, think about our collective futures. And I think for that one needs a very long and strong vision. If somebody has only a conference level vision, it would not work. It needs to be a long term project, and I think the work is still going on, fortunately. And then, of course, um, you know, I work with black intellectuals uh, of, you know, and and my home at Harvard, first home was Department of African and African American Studies. So it was, you know, like they're like, okay, and that's where I met people from. Uh, uh, various parts but also African uh, because I studied Africa right I went to Africa that was a purpose I went there for a very specific purpose because I wanted to connect with the African people and uh, um, and what best way to do than to actually study them as well as you know PhD was the best you know experience and so I, I'm actually I was pushing uh, I went I, w- I went on to become the student leader of a postgraduates there and on the university scene it. So, when all of these things were happening, there was one issue that our people are so much inward looking that they just didn't have enough time to look outside. So, some of us have to do that job. Some of us have to take that mantle and, and you know progress into a certain direction. And I think uh, that's how the, the project began. And I think we are trying to start a new intellectual project where many students as well as the youngsters will start an on campus anti caste activism network you know and it will be the first in the world anywhere anytime it has happened and i think that is the golden opportunity for people like you or others to actually you know get because wherever i went i i've been this is my fifth year in america and i went to so many universities students are very excited I was in Dartmouth College, a student from China came and she's like, I want to, you know, but she was also very hesitant. She was, she was like, no, I don't want Indians to tell me I'm appropriating the cause, you know, so, but at Dartmouth College, it was almost like they were, we want to do it. You know what I mean? So at Harvard, we started uh, a small base, but if it a students led thing happens, that has a more university takes it seriously. And also it's a larger inspiration, right? And so students can have their own conferences based on caste. And if you guys do that, the whole community will file behind you to support and students will lead this as to how to fight. Because we talk about human rights issues across the world. We talk about human rights issues in almost every corner and nooks of the world. Why not also human rights issues of Dalits that are actually suffering and subjects of world's oldest surviving discrimination. And I think that's about an invitation to all of you. Thank you. I think uh, we've, we've gone over time um, and we want to reserve some time for the garlanding uh, which will start in about four or five minutes. So I'd encourage you all to head over to the area just down outside of the room here, go straight down, it's on your right, and uh, we'll finish up the, the day there. So thank you very much to everybody for your comments, and thank you. 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 For coming to uh, the university and helping us uh, celebrate the life and achievements of Baba Sahib, Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, before we uh, go any further, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that we are uh, 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 standing here at the unceded territories of our brothers and cousins uh, of diverse nations, and we just wanted to say our appreciation and thanks uh, for allowing us to be uh, on their on their land. Uh, Dr. Koh and I were having a brief conversation earlier uh, about about one of the uh, uh, previous uh, leaders of Simon Fraser University, who I just realized about a week ago had passed away. His name, uh, in my view, is still is uh, Dr. Donald Grayston. I just wanted to, to take a minute and, and pay respect to him because uh, uh, our earlier conversations that started at university involved Dr. Grayston, in, uh, starting even in 95, 96.
So in 1996, he was director of the Institute for the Humanities. Right. He, and he helped us to bring Baba Sahib Dr. Ambedkar's books at that time and a photo to the to the university. Uh, since then, we have also been working with Maninder, and I want to say thanks to Maninder uh, as well for being with us for all this time. If you guys don't mind, uh, uh, I'd like to take uh, uh, a pause for a minute, and then so that I can think about and pay my respects to, to Dr. Grayston, who had a lot of who had left a lot of impact uh, and influenced uh, 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 my thinking uh, in terms of leading a lesser, lesser stratified. Uh, societies. So please join me at your discretion for about a minute and then we'll uh, uh, pay respects to Dr. Wisdom. Thank you. My name is Jay Birdie and I'm representing Chatna Association of Canada and we have a number of our members uh, and supporters of the association who are uh, with me helping us to make this uh, celebration and I want to also share my appreciation to the, uh, uh, to the community and to the team. I'd like to start off by uh, uh, inviting our friend uh, Dr. Redder acting dean for the, for the library. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, our partnership with Institute and the library has been a long standing and uh, it started in 1995-96. So we also wanted to say thanks to you for the leadership, on behalf of your leadership, uh, for helping to maintain this relationship. So I'd like to please join me in welcoming Dr. Ratter so that she can, uh, on behalf of the library, uh, uh, express her uh, gratitude and welcome you, and then call upon uh, Dr. Suraj Yangde to do the gardening of Baba Sahib Dr. Ambedkar, uh, and, then, and, then, uh, uh, and then we'll ask other members to also pay respects uh, uh, after Dr. Yangde. Thank you. Thank you very much. I typically standing in this space is Dr. Gwen Bird, who's the uh, actual Dean of Libraries, but gone for this semester. And so in the summertime, when she gave me the list of events that would happen over the fall, she reminded me to circle October 11th on my calendar, because this was an important day that she always attends. And I just really want to speak and convey not only my own appreciation, but her appreciation for this kind of event. We really want the library to be a place where a community can come in and pay respects to their intellectual and community heroes. And I mean, I, I had the opportunity this afternoon working with some grad students uh, to mention what I was doing. I was slipping out of my office to come down to here, and I mentioned um, Dr. Ambedkar, and uh, immediately uh, the, um, my student who studied international studies told me about how much he admired him, and I was really proud that we were having this today. So please, um, our, our sincere um, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for coming. And please, may I now um, also very looking forward to reading your book. Dr. Saraj, please come in. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah, this is this is a great woman. As we're starting this uh, ceremony, yes. we just heard the uh, uh, national anthem oh, of Canada. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> So, so I'll have uh, uh, a surat uh, to say a couple of words uh, about about the uh, uh, importance of Dr. Ambedkar's Basti in this house. Thank you, uh, Jay, and thank you, Chetna Association. I was asking about the history behind putting a bust because uh, we also uh, did the similar thing uh, in Brandeis as well as UMass Amherst, and we knew the heavy logistics it involves, especially dealing with the university admin and you know the bureaucracy uh, but we are fortunate enough because when we mention about Ambedkar uh, to some scholars especially in UMass Amherst it is in Africa house uh, there is an Africa house but it's a, it's a center of revolution because uh, the uh, the black uh, 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 intellectuals who were in UMass Amherst actually fought for a specific black centric program and for both black faculty it's a very historic center and there the faculty is there acknowledged by our statue. Now when I was seeing here, you know, uh, <laughs> we knew about Canada having uh, statues way before us. So I think that was a very big inspiration and uh, having come here to the SFU, it's almost like a pilgrimage because this place is no less than that and uh, because we have very few centers across the world which we can call our pilgrimage because our history is also, which is written, which is very recent. So whenever we install Baba Sahib, uh, it's not only through the uh, devotion, but also it's through following his intellectual pathways. So putting Baba Sahib into a library uh, uh, registers into the minds that we value education as the highest priority. And we think the change that's going to come through education. And even though our uh, th there is a lot of under-education given to our community, we are hoping uh, by installing statues like this, the students from our communities uh, would come to the institutes wherever Baba Sub statues are there because we want also to send a message that this university is also for you. It is There is your Baba Sahib who is here and you very rightfully deserve a place to come and educate and this is actually, uh, it would be a huge, for example, I went first time to England for my first degree and I was, uh, uh, you know, never mind the, the British, uh, but I was very much a cultural shock. I was wondering Let's say if I would have come to Simon Fraser and had I seen Baba Sahib, I would have not felt the isolation and the kind of a mental, uh, you know, suffering that we have. Um, and I think this is infrastructure uh, and this is a very monument. And also SFU has a very important place in the larger histories of the Dalit world because it has managed to have a Ambedkar here. And I am sure wherever Indians or our people would come, Canada, they will make sure they will visit, if not many, at least two places or three. Uh, York University where there is a statue, SFU, and in other places where there, there is a monumental structure of this. And I really like to congratulate for the generosity of the community because this is what we want, right? I mean, the community still involves and salutes to the leadership uh, way back in 2004 who made this possible and they actually inspired us to do similar activities in the rest of the world, more specifically in the USA. So thank you and thank you to you all who have witnessed this closely and still continue to come every year. Jai Bhim. Brother Suraj uh, mentioned that this place is uh, serving as a pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage, right? And I, I, I can totally relate to that. I just wanted to add by saying that as many many of you know, that, that our ancestors were denied the right to have a place of worship. They were denied the right to go to schools. So when we come to these institutions. For us, these are not just institutions. These are temples. Universities Beautiful. are temples of knowledge, mm. right? And we take pride in it. Maharishi Shambhuk, you know, he was trying to educate. He was assassinated, you know. So, so having uh, the place where we can carve our home means a lot. 
in Canada, we talk about truth and, re uh, truth and reconciliation. I think we need to learn from that. What does that mean? And then how can we take the learning from that experience and apply it? Because many of my generation and of the future generations, you know, and the past generation are still dealing with this issue. Sure. So I think as Suri had mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of cross-learning that, that we need to uh, uh, take. And once again, I wanted to say thank you for providing us this temple of knowledge, you know, where we can feel at home. Thank you. Now I would like to call upon uh, uh, Brother Paul uh, Crow, uh, representing uh, the University, the Institute for the uh, for the Humanities, again for the relationship uh, that we had, to also say a few words, and then uh, uh, about Dr. Becker and and the uh, and the importance of having this bust in this location. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, once again say thank you to everybody for coming to Simon Fraser University. Um, yeah, my department is a department of humanities where we're trying very hard to expand the horizon of what we do um, to include so many more voices. Um, Donald Grayson actually was, was one of the leaders who, who really really looked to many different parts of the world, uh, to many different communities, to bringing uh, diverse voices to bear on the humanities. And uh, Dr. Ambedkar fits into this picture beautifully uh, with his humanitarian values, with his uh, uh, championing of the, the rights to have a voice for everybody. Um, and this is something we, we hope our department can do. We try to do this in our classrooms with discussions of, uh, among people from so many different backgrounds across many different disciplinary divides. Um, it's really about uh, dialogue, conversation, and learning, mutual learning. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to have uh, this, uh, this bust here in uh, Dr. Ambedkar in the library at, on, at this place. And we hope in the future, we, we have made some, some, some beginnings of bringing Ambedkar's legacy into the university to share with students, and we hope longer term we can do much more. Um, if I were to, <laughs> to sort of dream right now, I would say I, I would love to see a chair in Ambedkar. Beautiful. Uh, I, I, I don't know how it will happen, but uh, you know we have to keep we have to keep our eyes forward and hope. So, thank you all, and thank you for your support, and, uh, and thank you, Indiana, for the space, the library. And the one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now I, I would like to uh, uh, first of all congratulate the local uh, community, particularly the youngsters, uh, students, uh, alumni of the uh, uh, UBC and San Francisco universities and other local institutions uh, uh, led by uh, Harsh uh, uh, and who just had a dialogue uh, with uh, with Sue earlier, so I'd like to call upon um, uh, uh, the the members of the reading uh, group to come forward, uh, pay their respects if they wish, and uh, and then also to say a couple words uh, uh, about about the importance of having dialogue and having Dr. Ambedkar in our lives. Beautiful. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone who's here, uh, who came out today to the event, and uh, thank you to Suraj, thank you to uh, Chetna really for uh, being such a strong voice in the community, and uh, you know even encouraging us and being a really strong source of support for the for our projects and for our reading group, for example. Just you know, Jay has been there at every single meeting uh, since we started months ago and and it really means a lot to us uh, when, when people like you are, are you know looking after us and guiding us uh, in this way and similarly I think it speaks for uh, Dr. Ram Baker being here his presence here in this university where we have this dialogue at the same time when we acknowledge um, uh, you know that, that we are having this dialogue on unceded territory uh, on the on the land that was forcibly taken away from indigenous uh, people over here, uh, and we would like to extend that solidarity in our struggles. And when we have those dialogues, I think it's really important to keep that in mind uh, and, and continue doing that moving forward. So thank you very much.
Thank you, members. I really appreciate uh, your support and the uh, work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, some of our elders who, uh, who are here, uh, who have been uh, supportive to us in many of our activities. And I'd like to call upon my mom, uh, first of all, uh, uh, to come forward and pay her uh, respects to Baba Sahib, Dr. Amir Karis. Hello to see you, know. And my, uh, 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 every, my, my dad, who passed away about three and a half years ago, every time we would have an event, he would always be here. So I know he's here with us in our spirit, and uh, uh, my mom would also represent him. ਕਹਿੰਦਾ <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, I also have. Uh, uh, thank you, Suraj. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, 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 my mom said that uh, uh, for us, uh, Doctor Ambedkar is the is the son who has given us the light, who has given us the knowledge. He's the one who has given us the opportunity to become educated. Uh, we are here because of the, uh, what, the, the work that he has done and the inspiration that he has given to all of us. We also have uh, a couple of our uh, elders, we call them uncles. You know, they are, uh, anyone who's an elder is, a, is, a, is an uncle, uh, if not by blood, then, then certainly by, uh, by the community. I would like to first of all call upon uh, Uncle Ji uh, uh, Kreenpuri Ji to uh, step forward and pay his respects. Uncle Ji Sibi Akte Shabdade Kool. Thank you. ਅੱਜ ਮੈਂ ਬਾਬਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਦੇ ਭਾਰਤੀ ਕੋਲ ਖੜਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਦੇ ਅੰਦਰ ਬਾਬਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੂੰ ਜਦ ਪੜਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਮੇਰੇ ਦਿਮਾਗ ਦੇ ਕੁਆਰ ਖੁੱਲ ਗਏ ਮੈਂ ਪੜਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਘੱਟ ਗਿਆ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੀ ਉਮਰ ਦੇ 50 ਸਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਮੇਰੇ ਪੂਰੇ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਕਿ ਜਦ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਾਣ ਜਦ ਤੋਂ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਆਇਆ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਕ ਬਹੁਤ ਖੁੱਲੀ ਹਵਾ ਚ ਸਾਸ ਲਿਆ ਔਰ ਮੇਰੇ ਹੱਥ ਕਲਮ ਆਈ ਮੈਂ ਲਿਖਣਾ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕੀਤਾ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਮੈਂ ਕੁਝ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਬਾਰੇ ਲਿਖਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਹਾਂ ਪਰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇਦਾਂ ਯਾਦ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਕੀ ਕਰਾਂ ਜੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਕੋਈ ਲੈ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਕੁਝ ਨਾ ਕੁਝ ਲਿਖਿਆ ਬੋਲਣ ਦੇ ਲਈ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਸ਼ੁਕਰੀਆ ਅਦਾ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸੰਸਾਰ ਦਿਖਾਇਆ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਜੀਵਨ ਸਾਡਾ ਮੁਕਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਤਾਂ ਕੋਟ ਕੋਟ ਪ੍ਰਣਾਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਬਾਬਾ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਅੱਜ ਦਾ ਨੌਜਵਾਨ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਸਿਹਤ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਚਾਨਣ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਰੋਸ਼ਨੀ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਸੰਸਾਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਰੋਸ਼ਨੀ ਬੰਦੇ ਮੈਂ ਤਾਂ ਇਹੀ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਨੌਜਵਾਨ ਕੋਲੋਂ ਆਸ ਕਰਦਾ ਜੈ ਵੀ ਨਮਸਕਾਰ Uncle Ji has also shared his uh, uh, feelings about uh, Dr. Ambedkar and how uh, Dr. Ambedkar has been serving as a light. So we have Suraj in uh, real life here and um, uh, symbolically I guess uh, 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 we have been lit by this positive energy. 
Uh, now I'd like, like to also call upon Uncle uh, Lashman uh, um, Heiji to also uh, to pay his respect. Uncle Lashman Heiji. I want to uh, also acknowledge uh, one of our members, uh, one of our pioneers, who founded Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Association, uh, uh, I believe in 1981. So Mr. Mohan Banga, uh, he's here with us, and I'd like to call upon Mr. Mohan Banga to uh, uh, also pay his respects to Baba Sahib, Dr. Ambedkar. So I'm very happy to see that whatever we started long time ago, uh, it is being uh, progressed day by day by the youngsters. Uh, so that's the real uh, mission when somebody starts it and it's taken over by the educated community. I'm very grateful to, to you all and being a part of uh, this mission. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar, he uh, he is a symbol of equality, and he is a symbol of liberty, and he is a symbol of brotherhood, and he points towards the teachings of Buddha, uh, which is uh, full of compassion, <coughs> love, and kindness, and that's what uh, similar. Uh, conclusion was made yesterday by Suraj Yangde when he said that we should love Dalits because uh, Dalit people have learned from their ancestors to love everybody uh, even in uh, uh, very difficult situations they, they don't give up so we have a hope that we all will uh, live happily and, uh, and try to serve the community we live in Thank you. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, uh, one of our younger members who's the PhD uh, uh, scholar and she's doing research on uh, 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 caste in the Lower Mainland. Uh, she's also participated in the uh, Dr. Baker reading groups. Uh, I'd like to call upon Sasha uh, uh, to, uh, to pay her respects. Thank you. Um, should I just say two things? Um, so I'm, uh, this is actually the second time that I've been at one of the garlanding ceremonies here at SFU. And um, what I continue to see is the kind of support in the community. So many people come and continue to come and it truly is a site of pilgrimage and a mecca for people in the community. And um, from Jay I've learned the generosity of the Punjabi people here in talking about these issues, having a dialogue and encouraging conversation among young people. So I'm so happy to be here and to learn from you all and to hear your stories and also to kind of be part of this uh, series of events with Suraj to think more about these uh, very pressing and urgent community issues. So thank you. Uh, we also have another uh, uh, young member uh, who's uh, 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 becoming more and more involved uh, every day, and uh, every day he's adding to the to the dialogue. Uh, and, and recently he was featured on a Punjabi channel, uh, and he, where he and some of the other members talked about uh, the session that's happening tomorrow at uh, KPU. So I'd like to call upon Aman uh, Sani to uh, uh, also represent his uh, uh, his members and supporters and pay his respect to Balasa Dr. Mohan. ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਚ ਮੈਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਿ ਵੀ ਇੱਥੇ ਇਵੈਂਟ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਸਾਡਾ ਇੱਥੇ ਸ
तो उधर भी एक साड़ा कल्चर है मतलब एक साड़े एक अटेम्प्ट है कि है कि आप जिधर कास्ट सिस्टम है पंजाबी कल्चर दे बीच उन्हों कितना आप एंगेज करना है एंड उन्हों आप कितना उधर जिधे तहां दे बीच जा जा के जब आप समझ सकिए कि जिधे आप एक सुपीरियरिटी और इनफीरियरिटी थ्रू लास्ट नेम आप वी हैव क्रिएटेड उन्हों कितना आप चेंज करिए ताकि वी मूव टुवर्ड्स द डायरेक्शन ऑफ बीइंग मोर अ कास्टलेस सोसाइटी जिथे तो आधे लास्ट नेम इज नॉट द प्रोफाइलिंग ऑफ योर बीइंग बट इट इज अ वे ऑफ जस्ट अ लास्ट नेम यू हैव तो उधर विच मैं कहूँगा कि ये जो एसएफयू द इवेंट है ये काफी मतलब बढ़िया इवेंट है इतने एसएफयू द विच दे सेलिब्रेट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ बाबा सा बीम राउंड अंबेडकर एंड ये आगे तक और चलना चाहिए सो दी कमिंग जेनरेशन जिधर इंडिया तो जितना मेरे तरह आई है कि है दे लर्न मोर एकेडमिकली दी बेनिफिट्स एंड दी प्रॉमिसेस विच दी फिलॉसफी ऑफ बाबा सब अंबेड कर होल्ड सो Uh, we are very pleased with this board uh, and leadership we are getting from Chetna members. And our president, uh, Mr. Srinderanga, and his wife are also here. I'd like to call upon Mr. and Mrs. Srinderanga to um, step forward and pay their respects. Are you on आज बहुत पंजाबी देवेश बोलूँगा। आज बड़ी खुशी हुई है सानू। वैसे इस पंजाबी साड़ी माँ बोली भी है कि यह क्रेडिट आज ऐसी रहने आए ये भी साड़ी था कि आपने माँ बोली है। बहुत खुशी वाली कल ले आ। वैसे सूरज जिधर वो ताहा देखी था आज ऐसी तात्री तेरे भी आधा देख लिया। सारे एक बारी ताकि ह वो साड़ा वड़ा साथ दे रहे हैं या जो तो वहाँ से कोई प्रोग्राम रखी था जुनी वासी रखी था कितने भी रखी था उन्होंने आके साड़ी इन्हीं बढ़िया गाल सोनी है और इन्हीं बढ़िया गाल कर दिया ऐसी उन्होंने कोनो काफी लर्न कर दिया ऐसी इतिहास इधर प्रवेश साहब हो और साड़े बड़े साथ दे दे या जो तो इतने वे इन्हें दा ऐस टाम ते हैगा या ता ए सर्मनी करनी है बाबा साधी इन्हें मैं किंदा होया सारे तो मैं तानवाद करता बाबा साधे किंदी बाबा साधी सोचते पैरा दिए ठोके uh, Mr. Sajid Abans and his wife Majid Abans. Uh, Majid is also very active. Uh, she's also on the planning committee for the uh, for the uh, session that, that that's happening uh, tomorrow. I'd like to call upon both uh, Sajid and Majid to step forward and uh, pay their respects. First of all, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, this is our, I think, um, we come every year to Ghana here. And uh, Baba Sahib has a very important place in our life, personally uh, in our life. Actually, I was born in Ambedkari family. So I think that was the biggest positive thing in that society where everything is negative around. So, you know. So um, he's a icon for us and for all the communities, for all the, um, almost like everywhere. So, um, and uh, actually I learned one thing uh, from Baba Sahib. Uh, I don't know how, like from the beginning and uh, until now, that uh, um, community, community should be casteless. I did not read that time inhalation of caste or anything, but it was in our mind from our family. So 
uh, that's the uh, thing it should be like there should not be any chaos or anything uh, and there is event going on uh, Aman said so I agreed to appear with Aman and that it should be castless and tomorrow is the event so we should not be recognized anybody from their last name or anything so all are human beings all are equal so that's what uh, Baba Sahib's uh, dream was so we need to complete it um, being educating by ourselves and educating others about this caste system and equality so that's the way we can uh, fulfill, fulfill his dreams thank you so much Jai Pim, Jai Pahat, very happy, uh, very good uh, to hear uh, for gardening and then because Baba Swab who gave us uh, equality, liberty and fraternity, that's why I'm here. And another thing, in this month, uh, Baba Swab on 14th October, he embraced Buddhism and uh, gave us a choice. Um, so uh, that's what... Uh, uh, I'm very happy because we already embraced Buddhism a couple of years ago. So uh, we try to fulfill uh, whatever Baba Sahib said. That's what I think. Thank you very much, JP. Thank you very much, Sujit and uh, uh, Manji. Uh, our friend, Mr. Sudhir Prakash, here. He is the president of Indian Buddhist Society. Uh, is also joining us and I uh, would like to call upon him uh, to pay his respects. First of all, I really appreciate the uh, SFU authority and our campus because uh, they gave us a chance to explore the vision of Baba Saban. Uh, behalf of Indian Buddhist Society and myself, I am really thankful SFU and professor, staff, student, everything. So I really thank all to you, Mr. Javed Bisa and Chitana Association and uh, Mr. Surya. He came from the States. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Jai Parat, Jai Thank you, Sabahini. Uh, uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of my wife, uh, Nirmal, who is also been very supportive and understanding, and like to call upon uh, uh, Nirmal to also step forward and pay her respects. No, 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 no. Uh, I just want to say, because if I'm here today, because I'm Baba Sahib Ambedkar, so it's hard to say thank you in the words, words but thank you bottom of my heart. Uh, our another member, Rekha uh, Chumber, she's not feeling well, so, uh, 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 so I just wanted to acknowledge uh, her, uh, her presence, so thank you. I uh, just wanted to see if I missed anyone. Would you, I, sorry, we haven't. Would you like to say step forward and then pay your respect? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch uh, you. My name is Kirby Hewitt. I'm a psychologist here at, um, at Simon Fraser Health and Counseling. And um, I have a family relationship to India and great respect for Dr. Nikar. And I'm so happy that his presence is here at the university. Um, just to remind us about the important message of equality, of access to education, um, of just a fundamental relationship among us as human beings. And so I was really grateful to know that this event happened and I wanted to just make time in my day to, to meet with you and thank you very much for calling on me. Though I wasn't prepared to say anything, <laughs> but it's very nice. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And I think I think, I think this this is this is this is the vision that we have. You know, this is the one of the purposes of having Baba Sahib Dr. Ambedkar here. Right? People learn about him and then if they have affiliation, you know, then, then it, it reminds them that, that we are at home, you know, with the relationship that we have are also 
uh, strengthened here. So, so I just wanted to say thanks to you for for, for, for finding out about about Dr. Baker and then and then and then about this event and then joining us. So, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Uh, my apologies if it has taken longer than, than than we had expected. But one of the philosophies we have is is about inclusion, right? And uh, we wanted to, time permitting, you know, wanted to acknowledge everyone and and have them included. Uh, in the uh, 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 in the activities, so I think I've been able to, to to do that. Did we miss anyone or? You were right. No, okay. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Close closingly. <laughs> and then this is gonna do the closing, but I just wanted to see. Yeah. So so I think we if there if we haven't missed anyone. Then uh, I'd like to call upon uh, uh, Maninder, as I mentioned uh, 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 earlier. Uh, Maninder has been one of the constants, uh, uh, members uh, and representative of this university, I think since uh, 1995, right? And then uh, you were the first person who helped us with the presenting uh, Balasar Dr. Baker books every year. Sometimes we have two events, sometimes we have four e events, but at a minimum we have two events. And every time we call upon you or some of our other members call upon you, you're always there. And uh, uh, on behalf of ourselves, we wanted to express our gratitude to you and through you express our gratitude to the entire university for being that bridge. Suraj talks about, you know, uh, uh, leveraging relationships, right, creating uh, bridges and strengthening those uh, uh, bridges. And I'm glad that, that some of the concepts you have shared, those are uh, uh, being practiced, right? We need to learn more about, you know. We learned about, about, the, uh, about the literature. Uh, Dr. Radder mentioned earlier that she had heard about Dalit literature, right? And again, the fact that you have heard about it, right, and, and uh, that, 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 that's amazing, right, because not many non-South Asian scholars would have known about it, right? And, and then if South Asian scholars have known about it, they would not have the courage to, to talk about it, let alone teach it in their conversations. So, so just wanted to say uh, thank you, Maninder. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Radder, uh, Dr. Uh, Ekro. Uh, once I start feeling comfortable, I started saying brother, and then so I feel comfortable, so I'm going to call you brother Paul, <laughs> and, uh, and that, that's, that's the nature of the relationship we, we, wanted, to, uh, we wanted to have. So uh, without further ado, please join me in giving a warm round uh, of applause to uh, uh, Maninder uh, to say a few words, pay her respects, and then uh, uh, give a closing message. Please start Paul. I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, you're always welcome to come, and not just during the garlanding ceremony, but at other times as well. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Jay has provided great leadership uh, in first reaching out and actually saying, oh, your library doesn't have these books. And then since then, the library has been collecting uh, you know, books about Dr. Ambedkar and, uh, and the community. Um, I think each of us do a small part in whatever way you know we can to make this a better place in the world. Um, some of us don't have the intellectual words and, and uh, you know the way of fighting the way scholars do. So we try and make sure that the scholars' voices are heard and their inclusive voices are heard. And so it's really important that we have uh, you know fighters with the uh, quill. And then we have others who do their own thing in their own space. Um, education has also been very important in my own family. Uh, I'm also here by chance. Uh, my father was one of the you know, uh, six children in his family and the only one who had the chance to get educated. So he came from a small village in Punjab. And I uh, just want to say a few words because you know, he passed away this year. But he spent his entire life, um, you know, becoming educated, better educated, provide, you know, coming to Canada, studying again, getting his PhD, wow. um, and then, you know, he taught for over 40 years. And then after retirement, he spent almost 20 plus years trying to get, you know, give lectures, you know, help students, help graduate students, and um, you know, so that people get a chance to have an education. Because when you have education or you have the opportunity to have education that's when all the doors start opening and that's when you have you know, all the tools you need to do whatever it is that you want to do in the world, you know, whatever your light is supposed to do in the world. So each of us have that light um, and we're guided by brighter lights um, and so let's just continue with the work 
and it's really hopeful to have younger people carry on the torch because this fight is really constant, ongoing, and has been for, you know, since man, have, man has been alive, I would say. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming and also for, um, you know, creating this opportunity to meet and, and talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Marinder. Uh, I, I forgot to mention and acknowledge one other uh, 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 friends. I just realized uh, uh, Mishira Ramji uh, was sitting there. Uh, Mishira has been a great um, uh, supporter and and, uh, well, and and he has attended a number of our, of, of our events, whether they are at the Surrey SFU campus or at the Harbor Center or here. And uh, just wanted to welcome you and uh, request you to also please uh, now pay your respects and if you'd like to say a couple of words that'd be great okay i'm shiraz ramji i'm 71 uh, that's my achievement uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you every i'm also uh, doing project on grandparents grandchildren uh, friendship oh, and wow. learning about what grandparents and grandchildren uh, learn from each other and one of the other thing i'm doing is a grandparents film festival so I'm telling his story through films and and other, like yesterday I found Tagore's film, so I'll be showing them. So I think these, these guys as, as a constitutional writer of India, I always liked the anthem, I was born in Africa, but that was one song I liked. Nowadays we call it anthem. Anyway, it worked, and uh, so I'm keeping my Hindi quite well. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, I, if you like to get a list of movies with grandparents, yes. please come and talk to me. Okay. And then I, I'll make another card with him inside. So, if you know his good films, let me know. Because I'm collecting movies with grandparents. And I found some juicy ones, Mariam Curie. And <laughs> <laughs> so, stay young. I think I'm 71, so people have to call me young, not old. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, on that uh, uh, note, uh, I guess uh, we'll, uh, 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 we'll adjourn with a salutation to Baba Sahib, uh, Dr. Hamed Karji. And Suraj, so would you uh, uh, pay us the honor by, uh, 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 by expressing the slogan and uh, uh, sal salutation to Baba Sahib, Dr. Hamed Karji, and then uh, I will repeat uh, uh, your words. Uh, I will say Baba Sahib Ambed Karki, you say Jai. I will say it three times. Then I will say Jai 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 Bheen. You reply with that. And the final will be Baba Sahib Ambedkar Amar Rai. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Ki. Jai. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Ki. Jai. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Ki. Jai. Jai 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 Bheen. Jai 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 Bheen. Jai 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 Bheen. Jai 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 Bheen. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Amar Rai. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Amar Rai. Baba Sahib Ambedkar Amar Rai. Thank you very much. This concludes the formal part of the uh, discussion. For the next few minutes, uh, 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 we're welcome to stay behind for a few minutes and take our photos or, 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 or have, a, have, a, have a conversation. So thank you for, for, for closing this area so students wouldn't be disturbed. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you. So, so this concludes our formal part of the, pro uh, the program. I also wanted to once again mention that if you are able to, to join us at the session tomorrow at uh, KBU uh, uh, in Surrey, that'd be great. And then on Sunday, uh, we're having a, a closing gala, the awards night. Time this uh, Tomorrow it's at 12 uh, p.m., uh, 12 to 4. And then on Sunday, we're having a closing gala, the awards night, where we're going to be recognizing four uh, chain champions, you know. Uh, and then that is happening at Kanda Banquet Hall uh, in Surrey uh, at 6 30. <laughs> so if you're able to, to attend any of these events, that'd be great. So once again, ja 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 ja, Jai ja 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 ja, Jai Thank you so much. Jai